a, it was a pleasure being here this afternoon. What I want to do is talk to you a little bit about a new initiative we have at MIT with the imponderable title of Interdisciplinary Consortium for Improving Critical Infrastructure Cybersecurity, which is my entire talk. Uh, the initials, of course, are IC, IC, OIC, or we call it IC cubed. But what I'm going to talk about is not only our own research, but also the things we're learning from our members of our consortium. These include people like from Exxon, from Schneider Electric, from New York Arm Electric, but also people like the New York Power Authority. So we're going to try to share with you both the research going on at MIT, but also what we're learning from these organizations. And so well, let me talk a little bit about the motivation for what we're trying to do. The, the first thing we've already mentioned before about this issue of IT, and the issue of cybersecurity for IT is pretty well generally known. You've all heard stories about the attacks on Target or Sony or the Office of Personnel Management. But our view is that the industrial control system world, the ICS world, in many ways is even more important and is even, even more at risk, and more importantly, has had much less research done on it. So we felt that was an important focus. But one particular insight, and I'll be interested in hearing your reaction to this, in all the various findings we have so far, and they are very spotty and we're looking for more sources, the majority of events are aided or abetted by insiders, usually unintentionally, but often happens. And that's why we believe it's important to be able to address the managerial, organizational, and strategic aspects of cybersecurity. And I often say, why is this important? Well, you already know the things. The only thing I will notice for those who weren't watching the news this morning, apparently in the most recent budget that Obama released today, there's going to be $19 billion proposed to be allocated to cybersecurity, which apparently is a 50% increase over last year. So it's clearly getting a lot of attention. Uh, but the other one I want to mention here at the bottom here was the SEC Commission from almost two years ago mentioned that boards that choose to ignore or minimize the importance of cybersecurity uh, do so at their own peril. A question, I don't know whether you know this or not, but in your organization, let me tell you a story first. I talked to one uh, CSO who said in the previous 10 years, he's maybe met with the board of directors of his company once. In the last year, he was asked to make three presentations. How many of you have seen an increasing interest and attention from the board of directors in your companies? I see a show of hands. Anybody seeing that happen? Okay. So one of the things that's happened is clearly there is interest out there. The question is, is that interest being focused in the right directions? So we pulled together a team of people. I won't go through the list, but the thing about them is they, they're brought together across the broad scope of MIT. We have people from the Sloan School of Management, which is my primary home. We also have people from engineering departments in civil engineering, electrical engineering, computer science, uh, aeronautic engineering, as well as people from political science because these issues are tough, naughty problems. I think the expression the millennials use, these are wicked problems that we have to address. They really need to bring to bear a wide range of talents. I won't go through this list. This is a quick list of about 16 projects we have going on. But just to illustrate the range of them, uh, one of the issues I mentioned before is the issue of board of directors are asking more and more questions. The question is, what are the answers for them? And in fact, are they asking the right questions? And we're working very closely with about two dozen board of directors to really try to help them better understand and also thereby help figuring out what other board of directors need to know how to be able to focus and direct their organization. Uh, one of the things you could be very helpful to us in, we have a project here called Lessons Learned from Industrial Control System Events. We believe there are some common themes out there. One of the biggest challenges we have, even more so, than the IT attacks is getting information, getting information in depth, really understanding what really happened. There's a number of cases where organizations will deny things even happen, even though it's generally well known in the public, if you will. So there's a real challenge we have there, and we're seeking assistance in addressing that. This issue of the IT OT, whether you like those terms or not, but the gap between IT and OT and what to do about that is an issue that we see over and over again and we're trying to look at better ways to address that issue. And one of the other things, I, I don't know how many of you are members of or have come from international firms outside the United States, but the idea is, of course, there's lots of initiative going on. I mentioned what Obama's doing. I just had a telephone conference with uh, members from the UK 
uh, uh, cabinet. Uh, there are issues going on, and we're working with people in the United Kingdom, Can Canada, Germany, Italy, Israel, to really try to understand to what extent can we work better together around the world. So these are all kind of examples of the kinds of things we're doing. What I want to do in the limited time I have this afternoon is just give you two or three minutes examples of some of the projects we have on the underway just to give you a flavor for what we're doing. And of course, I'll be glad to talk to you and explain to you uh, more about them as time goes on. The first one we call is a house of security project. I should tell you, by the way, you can see that we had clearly had an IT typist here uh, that should have been availability, not accessibility. And the order of which one is important is a big issue. But our view is these three things, with any order, clear are important, but they don't exist in a vacuum. You can think of them as the roof of the house, but the roof don't stand up unless you have the appropriate supports. Issues such as what resources are being deployed? What is the company's strategy regarding security? What is the culture of the organization? And those are things that typically are not studied very well, and as a result, are not being uh, deployed effectively in addressing the issue. Now, I, I gotta take a little digression. Uh, how many of you have an engineering background, may I ask? Show of hands, okay. So the bachelor degree was electrical engineering. When we started this project, we had a number of behavioral scientists working with us, and they recommended we measure the issue of perceptions. And I kind of stood back and said, whoa, wait a minute here, I'm an engineer. Why would you want to measure perception? Why not measure reality? Well, two answers. Number one, a lot of times reality isn't easy to measure. But as one executive pointed out to me, in many ways, perceptions are more important than reality because perceptions affect your behavior, and behavior is what we're most interested in. So we started a project to try to address this issue, to try to understand how are these elements, we call these constructs, inside your organization. And we do it in two ways. We ask a series of questions throughout the organization. And the way we do this, we ask questions not about you, but about your colleagues, because we all know you're perfect. But the question is, what do you think about your colleagues? Things like, how well aware are your colleagues of security risks to your organization? Now, you don't know, but you have a feeling about that, a perception. So we do these questions throughout the organization. And we do it in two ways. We ask, what do you think is the current state of the situation in your organization? And what do you think it should be? Now, you might say this should be maximum, but then you realize, as probably as mentioned before, there is some trade-off, some return on investment. So you may say, well, I think we're at a four now. If we can get up to a six, that would be pretty good. And we do that throughout the organization. We do it amongst people in the OT, o IT, non, people actually, actually do other work in the company, believe it or not. We do it at different levels, from the top management to middle management to the people who really get the jobs done, to really understand both what are the perceptions and to what extent are these perceptions common and uniform across the organization. And then we do is we also measure the gap between where you think you are and where you think you should be. And as you see in this particular study we did, this was about 500 people in, in four organizations. And you can see this security culture, in this case, was the biggest gap between where they thought they were and where they thought they should be. So this is one type of study. We use it both to illustrate where you are now, to compare across your organization, compare your organization with other organizations in your industry, in other industries, to kind of understand where you are now and also over time how it changes. So that's an example of one kind of project we do. Another one which is interesting, there's been a lot of research done in many places, including at MIT, on the is issue of accident prevention. And uh, we have a team of people, I mentioned we work with researchers in the aeronautics department at MIT, Professor Nancy Levson. How many of you remember the NASA, uh, the Challenger explosion a number of years back? A very really tragic situation. Professor Levson was a member of the team that was put together to kind of study the accident. If you read the newspaper reports about it, they'll talk about the fact that that particular launch was done on a particular chilly Florida day. You can appreciate having one of them today, I guess. And as a result, there are these things called O-rings, which I know very little about, but apparently they're rubbery material 
that if it gets particularly chilly, become kind of rigid. The O-rings uh, fractured somewhat. Some gas escaped and exploded and caused an explosion. A tragic story. End of story. And of course, the study that, that Professor Levson was involved in kind of confirmed all of that, but dug a little deeper. And the conclusion was kind of interesting. The conclusion was, if, if I remember correct, I'll summarize it, that an accident, not necessarily that accident, but an accident somewhat like that, was inevitable due to organizational changes made at NASA over the previous three years. Previously, the safety department was an autonomous division. It had been made subordinate to the operational division that had contractual obligations for a certain number of launches within a certain time window. As a result, a number of changes made on risk tolerances, management procedures that they felt led to a one in a hundred chance of an accident taking place. And this was missile, this was sh shuttle launch number 81. So that's why we believe you need to understand not just in what I call the proximity events, but what is the entire activity going on throughout the organization that is either helping you or in some sense impeding. Now this is looking at the issue of accidents. So the issue he said was we call our effort cyber safety. Can we apply methods and analysis techniques that have been developed, and many of you are familiar with them, in the safety parts of your organizations to cybersecurity, realizing that there are changes and adaptations needed as well. So that was kind of this mission. A few quick things about the methodology we use, which was called STAMP at MIT, was number one, it is top down. That's important because look at what it is you're trying to prevent. Because if you go around looking at every possible weakness you have, like that door over there may not be locked, but maybe it doesn't really make a difference. So you have to be able to focus your energies, otherwise you end up spending so much time and energy, nothing actually gets done. It's very much based on a process model of understanding there are processes, there are control mechanisms for processes, which may be human or automated, and there are mechanisms to change the process and to monitor the process. So it's a very much of an engineering style way of looking at things. But these processes are hierarchical. So I'm going to take maybe just a minute or two, illustrate one study we did. It happens to not be in your industry, but it was very illustrative, and it's the kind of study we want to do, and we are doing some in the ICS industry. Uh, this was a study of the uh, TGX uh, credit card break-in, which at that time was the largest. So this is the hierarchical model that was developed. And this is the kind of the credit card processing part at the bottom. What's interesting in, in this diagram, when we first put it together, I looked at it and said, well, this, you guys have got uh, kind of carried away here because up here, way at the top, you've got state legislature. What in the world has the state legislature got to do with it? And I'll, I'll cut to the chase, but there's a long story involved. It turns out that TJX headquarters is in Framingham, Massachusetts, about 25 miles west of MIT. If their headquarters had been in Nevada instead, this particular break-in would not have taken place. Why? Because Nevada required retail organizations to be PCI, payment card industry, data standard compliant. Massachusetts did not have such a requirement. And TJX, in fact, was not compliant. So in fact, the idea here, though, is that there's a lot of forces at work that create the environment in which things happen. And understanding all of those forces are important. I'll just get, we'll mention one more thing. I won't put all of this here. This is a longer part of a talk. But what's interesting here, if you will, was the notion I'll call the point number two. I don't know if you see this or not. It's, uh, there is a technical name for it called recall bias. That is an academic term for it that basically goes as follows. If it hasn't happened to you before, your assumption is it will never happen to you. A colleague of mine told me that 50% of all burger alarm systems are sold within two weeks after the house is broken into. So, you know, in many ways, human nature works that way. And of course, that's a big challenge. How do we get us to not be locked in to that we call recall bias? The other one I want to mention is called a confirmation trap. This is an actual email that was sent by the CIO of the organization to his staff. In summary, it says, 
We know that uh, we're not PCI compliant, but this is November, December, and Christmas holidays are coming up, very busy season, budgets are tight. Don't you all think it would be okay if we postpone this another year or so? This may shock you. Most of the members of his staff agreed with him. That's supposed to be a joke. The point being here is a lot of times we self-deceive ourselves in putting ourselves into harm's way over and over again. What was interesting about this is that this particular case, the uh, TGX break-in, got a lot of attention. It was studied extensively by the federal FTC in the United States, also the Canadian equivalent because they had big operations in Canada. And they came up with a number of, of, of recommendations. What was interesting, the methodology we used here confirmed most of what they had, but identified five or six weaknesses that TGX and other companies had that the normal approach of analyzing things would not have uncovered. So that's why we think it is a, a more powerful method for understanding the vulnerabilities in your organization. Then finally, the last example, as I mentioned vulnerabilities, is another study we have, kind of a fascinating study. How many of you are familiar with bug bounty programs? A hand for you are. But bug bounty programs are typically run by organizations like Microsoft or Facebook and so on, is they will pay you a certain amount of money if you discover a flaw in their software and report it to them. And of course, the Russians will pay you maybe a bit more, but that's another story. Okay, so those are called bug bounty programs. And there's several hundred of them, typically been in the software industry, but now it's branching out. Uh, for example, about a year ago, United Airlines started offering a bug bounty program. I have not heard of any in the ICS industry yet, but it seems like a very wise thing to do, because basically what it does, it turns loose hundreds or thousands or hundreds of thousands of other people who you don't pay anything to unless they find something interesting. So it's an interesting issue. So we've been trying to understand these bug bounty programs and come up with a number of ways to make them more effective. But the only thing I want to mention is a certain methodology we developed or we're using called system dynamics. And it really looks how things interplay. We've been looking at the issue this may surprise you, actually looking at the ecosystem of the cyber world. Understanding the life cycle. It turns out hackers, according to our study, have a relatively short life. What happens is they get expert in a certain type of hack, and when that hack no longer is fruitful, they kind of decide not to go and relearn, they move on to something else. Or they get married, they have children. A lot of reasons, it's interesting looking at the career path of hackers something most of you haven't looked at. So we've been looking at a lot of issues. Another interesting thing that happens, and Uber understands this, you, if those of you who use Uber and watch the rates go up and down, is that as you uncover and solve more and more problems, the problems remain and become more valuable, and more money is made available to them, which encourages more people to find more problems. So there's an interesting phenomenon going on. A few things you'll see here, this is coming from the uh, Verizon report, this is from the, I think, the 2009 report. As I mentioned before, about two-thirds of all events were aided or abetted by an insider, if you will. Uh, what was interesting was, in, in that study, uh, they found that about 80% of all breaches had a patch that had been available for over one year. And, oop, go back to the slide here. And about 75% uh, of cases went undiscovered for a year or more. Uh, one of the uh, phrases I use to kind of shake things up a little bit when I go into an organization, I say there's only two kinds of organizations left in the world. Organizations that know they've been hacked and organizations that don't yet know they've been hacked. Okay. Because a lot of time it's been going on and nobody has noticed it yet. This is a 2009 Verizon report. The recent 2015 report basically had about the same numbers, in some cases a little bit worse. So basically what's happening is we're getting better but the hackers are getting better too, often at a somewhat faster rate. So this is kind of a, just a flavor. The reason I wanted to make sure I, I, I preach the opportunity to meet you today is as part of our research, our research is very much grounded in the real world. As I often tell my students, there's no reason why good research can't be relevant. And working with people such as yourself in your organization, we understand, want to learn more about what you're seeing, why it's happening, and hopefully we can help develop ways to address it. So I look forward to meeting with you during the events uh, this week and in the future. And if you want to contact me, uh, that's my email address. I also want to point out Michael Coda has been also working very diligently with us uh, for a number of years. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>